Hello. This is the second part of my lecture on mental testing in the United States. It will deal with Henry Goddard, one of its most strident and influential advocates. Goddard was strongly hereditarian in his views, and hypothesized that mental defectiveness was due to a single recessive gene. This was not long after modern genetics had begun in 1900. Goddard became director of the research laboratory of the Vineland Training School for the People Minded in New Jersey in 1906. He recognized that the Vineland children were mentally defective to varying degrees and wanted to find some way of measuring levels of individual mental ability so as to determine what kind of training would be best for each child. He tried Cattell's anthropometric tests for a while, but did not find them useful. Then, during a trip to France, he learned about the 1908 binet simon scale. Seeing its merits, he immediately translated it into English, replacing a few cultural references with American equivalents, but otherwise leaving it unchanged. Goddard was the first person in America to make wide use of the binet simon tests, administering it to 400 children at Vineland and 2,000 children in the New York public schools, becoming convinced of its value. Although he found that the Vineland feeble-minded showed a wide range of scores on the binet simon scale, he also discovered that a large number of the New Jersey public school subjects also had low scores. That is, that mental disability was a widespread social phenomenon and not confined to his special school. Motivated by his results, Goddard began a campaign to introduce intelligence testing in public schools so as to locate all subnormal children and put them in special classes. He also offered courses for teachers in the Binet Simon scale and distributed thousands of copies across the United States. A forceful and dynamic individual, Goddard's work and campaign had enormous impact. Within half a dozen years, the Binet Simon scale was being widely used, playing an important role in the decisions teachers made about the education of children. It was also in use in several institutions for mental defectives, reform schools and juvenile courts, influencing the treatment of inmates and offenders. Based on his observations at Vineland, Goddard concluded that many of the feeble-minded not only behaved differently but looked innately flawed. This view seemed to be confirmed in his now famous Kalikak study of 1912. In this, he traced the descendants of a Martin Kalikak, a soldier of the American Revolution, who had both sired a son by a feeble-minded barmaid and had children by the Quaker woman he later married. According to Goddard, after tracing many hundreds of the two women's descendants through the generations, he had found that most of the barmaid's progeny were feeble-minded, immoral, or criminal, whilst nearly all of those of the Quaker woman were upstanding members of society. It is now known that the Kalikak study was badly flawed. Few family members were actually tested, and most were rated as to intelligence on the basis of their looks, or on second-hand reports or hearsay. Contrary to Goddard's own account, the two family lines had lived in very different social environments, as seen by different rates of infant mortality so that environmental differences were also likely to have been important. Nevertheless, at the time and for many years on, the study was taken as major evidence of genetic transmission of intelligence and its social consequences. Goddard was also a leading exponent of mental testing as a means of social engineering or on eugenic principles, arguing both that low intelligence was a serious social problem needing vigorous action and that many criminals, most alcoholics and prostitutes, and all those who were incapable of living up to the conventions of society, were innately mentally inferior. In this regard, idiots and imbeciles were not a problem, as they normally didn't breed, but high-grade defectives, those whom Goddard termed morons were likely both to become social misfits or criminals and beget offspring, themselves likely to be antisocial. 
Therefore, Goddard advocated the extreme position that the feeble-minded should not be allowed to marry or to breed. He served as an expert witness to two national committees advocating the sterilization of mental defectives, one extending this to paupers, criminals, epileptics, the insane, and congenitally handicapped. Legislators were impressed by the testimony of Goddard and other psychologists. By 1931, 27 U.S. states had laws authorizing eugenic sterilizations, and thousands of mentally and socially defective people were sterilized over the next three decades, 10,000 in California alone. These laws only began to be repealed in the 1960s often being replaced by new laws authorizing voluntary sterilization of the mentally retarded. Goddard was also involved in debates about immigration. Not only were many of the mass of migrants into the United States illiterate, but for the American upper class they seemed socially backward, raising fears that Anglophone white Americans were being swamped with social and mental defectives. The immigration authorities had already rejected about 10% of new arrivals, partly in accord with an American law forbidding the entry of lunatics and idiots, but it was feared that other undesirables were slipping through. In 1913, the U.S. Commissioner for Immigration asked Goddard to study the screening procedures at Ellis Island and offer advice. After one week's observation by himself and his assistants, picking out mental defectives on the basis of their appearance and then administering Binet Simon test to them via an interpreter, by m which means most were found to be defective. Goddard then recommended that immigration inspectors should use brief psychological methods based on Binet Simon tests to screen immigrants. As a result, deportation of the supposedly feeble minded went up by 350% in 1913 and by even more in 1914. Continuing his work at Ellis Island in 1914, Goddard found in initial studies that about four-fifths of Eastern and Southern Europeans were feeble-minded, and even in his final adjusted scores gave figures in the region of 40 to 50 percent. These findings, together with evidence offered by other psychologists of like mind, influenced Congress in the drafting of the severely restrictive 1924 immigration law, which reduced the quotas for migrants from southern and eastern Europe to one-fifth of those from northern and western Europe. For further details, see the section in our textbook for this course, Morton Hunt's The Story of Psychology.